Hey everybody, it's Rob Tiffany. Today I am broadcasting from the shores of the Columbia River in far eastern Washington, kind of wine country. Today I'm going to talk about what in the heck is API first mean? Well, let's start off with what does API mean? It's application programming interface. This is stuff that's been around forever. When you're writing code, you're building an application. Um, there's always interfaces to call functions, methods, things like that, setting properties uh, inside the application. Uh, and those APIs are how different parts of the application talk to each other. Uh, and then exposing APIs a long time ago was a way to let other applications on the same computer, for instance, uh, talk to it. Um, gosh, in my world, I didn't grow up in the Unix world, but I grew up in the Microsoft world. Um, early on, like if you're writing code in C or C++, you might create a, a DLL, a dynamically linked library, and you might uh, have exported functions, you know, interfaces uh, that can then be called from another application, you know, and so you can hook into those things to, to call those. Um, and so that's, that's how a lot of people that I know, you know, started off uh, exposing interfaces to other applications was, was through that, through in C or C++. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of had this notion of uh, object linking and embedding and COM, common object model, which again was a Microsoft thing, which was a, kind of an easier way to expose interfaces and data types and, and how to call into those things and make it easier and kind of had contracts and that's where you started having silly things like the registry in Windows, uh, going back to like uh, Windows 95 for instance. Um, and then programming languages could start to call those interfaces. Uh, and then to remotely call those interfaces across machines, you had technologies like CORBA uh, and, and DCOM, distributed COM. Uh, and again, so in the Microsoft world, that's, you could Whereas you might call a COM interface locally, now you could do it remotely across the network to another computer. And so, uh, you know, so call those functions, pass data, things like that. And so that's how you could do distributed computing. And, that, and there was all kinds of other ways to do this th stuff over time, you know. Uh, in addition to CORBA, you had, uh, gosh, there was .NET remoting. Uh, uh, Java had technology to do it. There was all kinds of ways to, to do it. Uh, but then came along this whole notion of... Uh, SOAP came along, SOAP and XML, uh, to expose interfaces kind of in a kind of a cross-platform language agnostic way where it wasn't dependent on what kind of operating system you had because usually a lot of these remoting technologies for different computers still required you to kind of be a part of the club, right? Um, so with SOAP, uh, you know, you could, it was, a, it was just a way kind of using XML to an HTTP to remotely call interfaces on machines and machines could be different from each other. It could be a Windows machine calling a Linux machine, calling a Solaris, calling OS2, calling whatever, Mac OS, you know, all kinds of things. It didn't matter. And so that really took off in the really late 90s and early 2000s was a the big time for SOAP and XML. Um, and then along the way though, we had this thing called REST. You know, uh, this guy Roy Fielding wrote a dissertation about representative uh, you know, state transfer. It was basically just saying, hey, let's just use the, the methods, uh, you know, post, you know, get, put, delete, things that are just part of the web, because the web is the most scalable thing we've ever built, <laughs> writing on top of the internet. Let's just use what's the basic constructs uh, of that to, to do stuff. And so that kind of came from a grassroots area. Um, and started gaining really big popularity, even in the midst of the soap revolution happening. Um, and then a lot of people started using a, a more succinct, compact way of serializing data uh, called JSON, which is a JavaScript object notation, instead of XML. And uh, it was just smaller, lightweight, because uh, uh, soap could be bloated and use a lot more bandwidth. Uh, which is no good, especially because also at that time in the early 2000s, you started to see the rise of the mobile revolution. And so you had these slow 2G speeds back then, and the data was called GPRS. And so just think about your 28.8 modem, right? Way, way back when. Um, uh, and then they aggregated that together to make it faster, and they came up with something called Edge. Uh, but still really slow, so you needed to be efficient. SOAP was not very efficient, but REST was much more efficient, uh, and JSON was more succinct. 
uh, and, and terse. So you saw the rise of that as a way to expose interfaces to call different functions of computer programs, server programs, whatever, across different machines. Um, so that grew and grew. And then pretty soon it totally supplanted SOAP and XML, even though there were all these standards bodies and everything working night and day on SOAP. Uh, REST just blew it out of the water. And so as we kind of got into the mid and later part of the early 2000s and then going to the 2010s, you know, the teens, you know, you, you saw the standardization of, of what you'd call maybe REST APIs or web APIs uh, as a standard way of exposing interfaces across computer systems. And again, in a cross-platform agnostic way. Uh, and you could apply gzip and stuff to make you more efficient. Uh, you started having, in addition to, to JSON, you could use different type of serialization formats to make it even more compressed. Um, so lots of work been done around that. And so lots of enterprises started, you know, wrapping their existing legacy systems in these REST APIs to make them available to maybe the web, you know, and other computer systems. Uh, started building stuff natively, you know, and so you saw that uh, additions to J the Java platform to make it easier to build these REST interfaces. Uh, in Microsoft, you saw it uh, part, part of a WCF, and then it kind of grew into its own kind of toolkit, uh, REST toolkit, and then it just took on a life of its own. Uh, but the, basically the takeaway is make it easy to build these RESTful APIs that are easy to call and to secure and to make them performant, maybe add caching and encryption and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, and but again, it's all just using the web, standards of the web, nothing unusual, uh, nothing proprietary. Uh, so if it works on the web, it works with the REST. Uh, and so that's kind of taken over the enterprise for sure, because uh, it certainly got grassroots on the, on the open internet. Um, maybe, you know, one of the downsides potentially over time was you, 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 a lot of times you had to provide documentation to say, hey, if you call this, if you do a post to this API, you know, a post meant you were creating a new resource, right? I'm, I'm doing an insert like into a database, you know, uh, put might mean you're doing an, an update to a database. Get is kind of like a select, you're getting data, right? Uh, deletes, obviously, you're deleting something. That's kind of like when you think about the database uh, CRUD operations. Create, read, update, and delete. So you see a lot of that stuff, but a lot of times maybe you had to provide documentation to say to, to another you know, party, hey, here's how you work with my API. Here's how it all, you know, here's, here's and, and I've done that a lot. Uh, here are potential return values. Here's what error messages look like. Um, but then we got this thing called Swagger. Uh, which was kind of a you know a way to, to document that for you, and uh, and write on the web, not having to provide you know like Word documents or PDFs to show you how to do it. Uh, you could just kind of go to the the URI for your REST APIs and maybe go you know slash Swagger, and it would show you a list of all the APIs you could call and all the data types and methods and properties and things you would pass in and return values. So that made things super easy, and Swagger kind of got adopted more broadly and there's the same thing called open API and I think we're on open API version 3 now so super important to do swagger documentation to make it easier for people to get at um, anyway that's what these APIs are all about and everybody's using them and there's also this notion of uh, API first uh, and what API first means is um, when you build your application let's say you're building a server application build the APIs first, design what the APIs are going to be to interface with other systems, to interface with a, with a GUI actually, because uh, APIs are essentially, they're invisible, they're headless, there's no user interface to them, right? Um, they're just methods you can call, functions, things like that. Uh, and so build, design your API first for your server application, if that's what you're doing, uh, and then build your application on top of this API that you designed, right? Um, why is this useful? Lots of people bolt on APIs after the fact to a monolithic type application, uh, and it's kind of inelegant and sometimes doesn't work too well. Uh, so it's just more elegant if you start with the API so that there's not like, a, sometimes people say, well, it's not fair. There's the interface that everybody else gets, like maybe on the web or whatever. And then there's the super secret API that special people get <laughs> that maybe works better or has more features or whatever. If you build an API first, 
and then you build your user interface on top of that API, whether that be HTML5 web pages, uh, native Windows apps, native iPad, Android, iOS apps, things like that. Everybody's getting on the same playing field, right? We're all talking to the same API. It all works the same everywhere. So I highly encourage you to go API first. You only get one chance to go API first though, right? You don't get to do it after the fact. After the fact, you're building Frankenstein. So when you're building the solutions, build the API first, then build the application on top of the API. It makes it easier for everybody to interface. Use Open API Swagger to give it, show it to the world. Uh, test the heck out of it. Use encryption. Use us, you know, TLS 1.3 is the latest. You know, use GZIP, deflate, do caching, you know, where you can on the server side. Uh, there's all kinds of great efficient things you can do to, to make your API. Uh, work really well for customers. So there you have it. APIs, API first. Do it, live it. I'm out.